I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith has landed herself a seat in the Alberta legislature with a win in Tuesday night's by-election in Brooks Medicine Hat. Today on Under the Dome, we'll take a look at Smith's win, what the numbers might say overall about the political landscape in Alberta, and what we can expect in the next six months before the provincial election. My guests today, political science professor from the University of Calgary, Lisa Young, and political science professor from Mount Royal University, Dwayne Bratt. Thanks very much uh, for joining me today. I do want to jump right into it. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, we're going to start right away with the by-election win of Premier Daniel Smith in the riding of Brooks Medicine Hat took place on Tuesday, November 8th. And I mean, right off the top, I do want to say Daniel Smith won. She had a 30-point roughly 30 point lead on her closest competitor. That's the NDP candidate. Um, but there is some talk right now of, of, you know, what is expected of a leader in a by-election and whether, you know, whether Daniel Smith won a commanding enough victory and, and even what that could say about their, uh, the UCP's electoral prospects as a whole, when we look six months down the line to an election and just a, a bit of numbers for, for viewers, uh, Daniel Smith won, I believe, 54% of the vote, which is my last look at the Elections Alberta website, compared to 26% for the NDP and 16% for former Brooks mayor and Alberta party leader Barry Morishita. Comparing that to Jason Kenney, when he won his by-election in Calgary a few years back, he had a, a commanding lead. I think he was up in the 70%. And looking even at the UCP win in that riding in the 2019 election, Michaela Glasgow um, at the time, took it with 60% of the vote. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, Lisa, we'll start with you. What do you make of, of the numbers? Is it Does it really matter at the end of the day a win is a win in politics? Or, or is it a sign that perhaps Daniel Smith may be struggling when it comes to popularity? Or is it a sign that the NDP and the Alberta party actually ran a solid campaign there? What, what's your take on the results from Tuesday night? Well, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is that she won. And that means that she can walk into the caucus as an MLA. She can sit in the legislature. That's really what she needed. Beyond mm -hmm. that, when we start, you know, dissecting the numbers and what they mean, you know, it's very much inside baseball. So uh, on the one hand, you know, this isn't the overwhelming win that lets her go into her caucus meeting next week and say, don't worry, folks, I've got this, you know, I might be trailing in the polls, but, you know, this is a sign that we can win the next election. I don't think you can say that based on these results. But by the same token, I don't think that anybody is going to be plotting for her downfall based on these results. It's, it's kind of neither one nor the other. Mm -hmm. and, and Dwayne, from your perspective, I mean, are we talking about a resurgent Alberta party? Are we talking, or is this, you know, specific to the local issues with, with Barry Mordashia being popular? Yeah. If, if this was a resurgent Alberta party, I, I think Barry Morishita would have liked to have passed the 20% threshold, right? This was a unique circumstance of having a by-election in the home riding of the Alberta party leader. If this was some unknown Alberta party candidate, you know, that, that, went from 7% to 18%, then maybe we could talk about that. But this was an absolute gift to the Alberta party. I know fundraising dollars did go up, but at the same time, they, they finished third. They finished behind the NDP substantially and even further, further away. And, you know, it's still early as far as party nominations go. The Alberta party has nominated three candidates. Um, they are not going to run a full slate. And so uh, this isn't something, I mean, yeah, they can, they can take a, a, some sort of moral happiness over what happened, uh, but I think they've also got to be a bit disappointed. Mm -hmm. and, and Dwayne, from your perspective, what do you make of, of the results overall from Tuesday night? Is it, is it a case of Daniel Smith probably could have done better? Or, or as Lisa said, she's in the legislature, she's, she can lead her caucus in these caucus meetings, she can sit in the House and... and and command, you know, the, the, have the presence that, that a premier would have. Winning is the most important thing. Yeah. And typically in a multi-candidate race for you to get over 50% is, is a landslide. But it's only in comparison 
to what happened in 2019, where not only did Michaela Fry, a young unknown candidate, get over 60%, but there was a disqualified UCP candidate who ran as an independent that got 17%. Mm -hmm. So it was probably closer to the mid 70s that the UCP got, or comparing it to Jason Kenney uh, in 2017 or Jim Prentice in 2014. Smith didn't take anything to chance. Uh, she spent the last 10 days, two weeks in Brooks Medicine Hat. She participated in election forums, which typically conservatives don't. Um, she door knocked. She brought in cabinet ministers. You know, she knew that she needed to, to win this. But, you know, to use a sporting metaphor, you beat a last place team in the exhibition season. It doesn't necessarily augur well for the playoffs. And that's when you start to break these down, that she didn't do as well as other people did. Voter turnout was half of what it was in 2019. And she lost the city of Medicine Hat. When you look at the polling data in the riding, she lost the small city and won in the rural countryside. Well, Janet Brown with CBC has a poll that came out a week ago showing that Smith is in trouble, not just in Calgary and Edmonton, but in the small cities. This replicates this. Then you combine it with winning with 53% on the sixth ballot. This just adds to those UCP members that may have worries about Smith. I don't think those were put to bed last night. Mm -hmm. And I did want to touch on that, that poll. Thank you for bringing that up, Dwayne. The, the, as, as you mentioned, Janet Brown did a poll for CBC. It, it looked at, you know, some unsurprising numbers in that the, the UCP, which has been trailing the NDP for a while, still trailing the NDP, but I believe the NDP has kind of widened the gap there. And then yeah. essentially Edmonton is, a, is an orange wave once again. Rural Alberta largely in, in UCP territory, but Calgary will be a bit of a battleground. And even the rural the rural areas, the UCP isn't leading by as much as many may hope they would. I mean, Lisa, where where do you see the party at and what Smith needs to do now, now that she's an MLA, now that she's premier, to to kind of turn the fortunes of the party? Well, she's got a really challenging uh, few months ahead of her because she's caught between the people who brought her into power and the promises that she made to them and then the available UCP voters on the other side, the, the more centrist conservatives that she needs to win back and bring back into the UCP fold. And so that is going to be really tricky. So she's got to move ahead on, you know, some of the promises that she's made. We're going to have something called the Sovereignty Act. You know, presumably we're going to see an amendment to the Human Rights Code. Those are going to be controversial pieces of legislation that will, will give her trouble. So then what's she going to do to appeal to those mainstream voters, those folks that maybe don't pay that much attention. And, you know, we hear from Rick Bell because that's, uh, you know, <laughs> the only way we know what's going on in the uh, UCP uh, government right now or the Smith government, um, that she's planning a pivot, that there's going to be lots of money spent to help us all with inflation, that she's going to take action on health care. And this is going to you know, appeal to those centrist voters. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're going to see her pulled in a couple of different directions. And it's going to be a question of, you know, to what extent she can really keep the Daniel Smith who won the leadership in the basement and uh, be a different Daniel Smith to, to speak to voters. Yeah, Duane, I mean, one of the things that you've talked about in, in some of the, the news stories I've seen your commentary in, the, the bumps that Smith has had along the way. And even through the by-election, there was yet another bump where she, it, it appeared that she kind of gave credibility to a, a Trump advisor who had called the COVID vaccines a bioweapon on, on the Alex Jones show. And there was talk that, you know, perhaps that this individual would be invited up to Alberta to kind of give advice on, on how to handle things in the health system. Again, when I want to learn about something, I reach out to the very best. With COVID, I reached out to Dr. Paul Alexander, Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Robert Malone, the inventor of the mRNA tech. Dr. Paul Alexander, we owe so much thanks for. He turned down that, that bribe for a million dollars from Pfizer plus $50,000 $50, a month. He's given everything. He's committed his life to this. And all they want is an opportunity to come to Alberta and have a conversation with this UCP government. And we're going to get him here to Alberta. Thank you. 
Ms. Smith. Uh, and I'll, I'll accept that invitation. Uh, I've got a group of doctors advising me, and I know that they've already reached out to Dr. Paul Alexander, so I'm interested in hearing what he has to say. Is the the idea of a pivot, maybe some inflation relief, maybe some some talk of reforming the healthcare system, is that enough to overcome some of these bumps that she's had along the way? So I want to separate the issues around COVID and pivoting away from COVID. Uh, and the inflation strategy. So on the COVID pivot that Rick Bell is talking about, uh, that would make political sense for her. Um, you know, I've got a piece coming out in CBC showing not only is her anti-COVID rules um, opposite to public opinion in Alberta, it's against at least half of her own party. Mm -hmm. So it splits her party. But I don't think she can pivot because she believes this. Um, and as evidence of her believing this, look at her record before she went back into politics. Look at her radio show where she either quit or got fired over her support over hydrochloroquine or ivermectin. Uh, and she continued to promote that in newsletters, social media after she left QR 77. Um, you know, her first instincts are to attack or to say that the uh, unvaccinated were the most discriminated against. She hears this wacky independence guy at a forum talking about Paul Alexander and how he's claiming that hundreds of doctors have suddenly died in Canada immediately after taking the vaccine. And instead of just ignoring that and going on to the next question, she goes, yeah, that's a guy I want to come and advise the government. So I don't think she's using a political antenna there. This is who Danielle Smith is. And these are also, to Lisa's point, the people that won her the party leadership. So we'll have to see if that pivot occurs and if it's a sustainable pivot. On the issue of inflation, this is an easy win for Smith. Uh, if you look at the Polyev playbook, he's been very effective at, at inflation and cost of living. And this would help her with bashing Ottawa and say this is just inflation. And so as a result, this is what we need to do in Alberta. The challenge she's got, though, is while there's lots of anticipated money flowing into the government, you know, a $10 billion, $11 billion surplus that she can spend, this year's money, the previous leader, the previous premier already spent it. So what do you do? Do you do do you go in deficit this year to to deliver inflation relief, uh, or do you wait until after the new fiscal year, which it, it removes you know the the winter heating bills? So Kenny has tied her hands a bit. As much as I think it would be easy for her to do, you know, with a gas tax abatement or rebates or dare I say, you know, Danny dollars uh, flowing in. I don't think they have the money until after March. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing I, I was curious about, and, and Lisa, we can touch on it now. The idea that does she go, does Smith and the UCP, do they go into the campaign with, in the spring, with kind of the, the big relief packages that, that we were talking about? Or does she try and get that all out now to really change the focus of, of the government and, all, and the focus on some of her negatives? Yeah, I think she needs to find some way of spending money now. And, and I absolutely take Dwayne's point that Kenny tied her hands, but hands can be untied, um, <laughs> you know, and presumably yeah. Travis Taves is now going to have to find a way to uh, spend money early or something. I, I don't think that promises are going to be enough. Um, she has such a narrow window of time to change the, the electorate's perceptions of her. And, you know, she already is suffering from the idea that she says one thing and does another. If she says help is on its way, just wait till spring, it's, it's just going to sink her that much further. So I think, you know, somehow in the back rooms in Edmonton, they are figuring out a way to actually put money in the hands of Albertans to address the inflation issue in a you know, almost a Hail Mary attempt to uh, turn the polls around. So you expect that when we see a throne speech in a couple of weeks or even even before we see the throne speeches, I mean, I mean, you mentioned Rick Bell. He had a column suggesting that there could even be a Ralph Klein style TV address, a state of the province. Do you expect that, you know, we could see that even sooner than than a throne speech on the 29th of November? Uh, you know, it's hard to say we're into 
you know, a fairly compressed period of time here. And she's been away from Edmonton for a couple of weeks now, as, as Dwayne pointed out um, in this by-election. So I wonder if there's going to be, you know, an eve of the throne speech address, perhaps uh, big news announced um, just to, to really try to set a new tone, have, have clear messaging and put some of this other stuff behind her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there, there are these issues that, are, that have proven divisive for her that she may want to put behind her, but front and center among those issues has been the Sovereignty Act. This idea, you know, it was during the leadership campaign, it was Brian Jean and Travis Taves and others lining up to say this is a horrible idea. This is, you know, we shouldn't vote for Daniel Smith because we're going to chase away investment, but it's going to be front and center, presumably, in the House within the first week of December. Daniel Smith has said that she wants to be in the legislature to be able to introduce the bill. Um, this was kind of the, the big keystone of her campaign. Dwayne, there's been a lot of talk about whether it will be moderated to make it, you know, more palatable for people so it would survive a court challenge. What are you anticipating that we'll see out of the Alberta Sovereignty Act when we finally get a chance to read it in a few weeks? Well, that's that's the challenge she's facing. How do you develop a bill that would be so different from what previous governments have done, but not so different to be unconstitutional? She's already said, no, we'll abide by Supreme Court of Canada rulings. But what about decisions of regulatory bodies or the, the federal government or lower court rulings that we don't know? Does she introduce something like Saskatchewan? She was praising the Saskatchewan First Act. Mm -hmm. Well, the Saskatchewan First Act simply said, you know, natural resources are a provincial jurisdiction. Yeah, that's what the Constitution says. So does she just repeat that line or does she go further? And that's the challenge. How do you deliver something to your base that wants a constitutional crisis, as Barry Cooper said, that's the point, versus members of her cabinet that say that could drive away in investment? Um, that's going to be a very tough needle uh, to, to thread. If I can jump in here, I think that Scott Moe has really done Danielle Smith a favor with his Saskatchewan First Act. Um, it, it sort of paved the road for something similar. She can say, look, I'm just doing what you know, my colleague in Saskatchewan has done. It stays inside the boundaries of the Constitution, which she was very careful last night to say that it would do. Um, so that keeps her caucus on side. I think the fact that Scott Moe is doing this and Saskatchewan hasn't exploded should reassure her uh, colleagues in, in caucus and in cabinet. So I think that what we're going to see is something called the Sovereignty Act that looks an awful lot like uh, Moe's legislation in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that draw into the problem that, that Brian Jean identified saying, you know, this is either something really important or it's meaningless. Uh, does that <laughs> yeah. go down to the meaningless thing and say, yeah, we can support that? And and what does you know someone like Rob Anderson, who's her principal secretary, who helped craft the Alberta First um, agenda, to be able to say, no, this isn't nearly what uh, that think tank paper said. I mm -hmm. suspect that you know the conversation that's going to be happening in UCP back rooms is, you know, to to, to be patient right? We need to win this election. So we need to, you know, make this more moderate. We can't be seen to be, you know, out there. So everybody just, you know, set aside your differences, set aside your expectations. When Danielle has won her own mandate, it'll be a whole new day, right? And I, I think that's probably the, the internal dynamic and the way that people like Anderson are able to make peace with themselves and, and the people that brought them, um, at least temporarily. But long term, this is going to be an issue. Yeah. Now, one last question bef before we wrap up for the day. I did want to flip over to uh, Rachel Notley in the NDP. Dwayne, as you mentioned, that the NDP was able to kind of pick up uh, support in in Medicine Hat proper in the Brooks Medicine Hat by-election. Janet Brown's polling is showing that the NDP is doing fairly well in the smaller centers. Does this result Tuesday night, even though their candidate didn't win, uh, Gwendolyn Dirk, 
Um, does this give them kind of a roadmap for the next few months, areas to focus in, you know, places like Medicine Hat, places like Lethbridge, places like Red Deer, as opposed to you know, really trying to make, make a case for themselves in, in kind of more rural settings? I think this confirms a strategy that they already know that they need to, to do, right? So they have talked about, you know, holding on to, you know, the Lethbridge seat, adding a Lethbridge seat, uh, working around the, the donut around Edmonton and, and winning a majority of the seats in Calgary. We haven't talked about Calgary Elbow. Mm -hmm. I think there was a reason why she didn't run in Calgary Elbow and, in fact, has left that seat vacant because they would have lost that seat last night. Um, e even if they ran a by-election with someone else, they would have lost that seat last night. And so I think that's where the NDP focus is, is going to be um, and just focus on the small cities. But they're not to say, as Smith did, we don't care about rural Alberta because Smith said, I don't care about the cities. Um, no politician should say something like that. But their electoral strategy, I don't think it shifted in anything. I think they've got confirmation that what they're doing is correct. Mm -hmm. and, and Lisa, last word to you on this. Do you get a sense that over the next six months, we're going to see more focus from the NDP on issues that, that resonate with urban voters and, and particularly in, in a place like Calgary, which appears to have, according to polling, a lot of seats up for grabs for them? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think anyone who's being, who has been paying close attention to Rachel Notley's whereabouts over the last couple of years probably notices that she spends a lot of time in Calgary. Um, you know, she's often in Calgary. She spends weekends knocking on doors with her candidates. And I think that is only going to intensify over the next six months. It's really about who can win Calgary and you know, what, what Notley needs to do is to just build on the foundation that she's laid, um, you know, really making herself seem like uh, someone who cares deeply uh, about Calgary. And, you know, she's gone out of her way and the party's gone out of its way to recruit candidates that really are of a caliber that are quite different from what they had in 2015, particularly in Calgary area ridings. And, and so it's going to be an incredible fight in Calgary, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it's something that we'll be paying very close attention to over the next six months. Dwayne Bratt, Lisa Young, thanks again. Yeah. You're welcome, Dave. Happy to be here. That's it for another episode of Under the Dome. Don't forget you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome, or you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time.